All right. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate you creating time to stay on KBC Channel 1 as we seek to explore issues that are of significance to the nation. Tonight, we just want to have a very serious conversation that touches on the devolution story, the successes, the misses, and some of the things that we have achieved with regards to the implementation of devolution and also having this conversation in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. So how have our counties fared when it comes to the mitigation measures for COVID-19 and what is the way forward for counties? We are also going to be talking about expectations ahead of the State of the Nation address by President Uhuru Kenyatta this coming week. So join me as we begin this conversation. My name is Safina Ching Oma and I'm going to be having this sit down with the Cabinet Secretary for Devolution, Eugene Wamalwa. Thank you so much, sir, for having us. All right, so we begin straight away with the devolution story. Yes. Um, you have been in this docket for quite some time, and uh, you have also uh, seen us transition into that journey of devolution for close to seven years now. Yes. I would like to get from your perspective uh, what you feel are some of the opportunities that were birthed by you know, us having uh, to implement devolution. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, f first of all, uh, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to... Uh, talk about the success story that is devolution. It is, ha I must say, it has been a transformative journey for our country. It's just uh, over seven years now, yet we have managed to cover so much ground uh, since uh, the 2010 promulgation of our constitution that ushered in a new era of devol devolution where we have devolved resources to the counties and devolve power to the counties for uh, Kenyans to be able to make their own decisions in their counties, in their localities, in accordance with their own uh, priorities. So we are happy. Uh, I'm the third minister for devolution, and uh, I want to thank my uh, predecessors for the good work they uh, did, beginning with uh, Governor Waiguru, uh, who was really uh, the one... Uh, to lay the foundation stone. And uh, after that, my good uh, brother Mwangi Kiunjuri uh, came in and I took over from him. So it's still uh, a, a young child that uh, we want to thank uh, His Excellency President Uhuru Kenyatta for nurturing because he is the president who has actually uh, midwived and, and nurtured this baby since the baby was born on his watch. And uh, uh, it's not been an easy journey. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's taken quite a bit in terms of uh, uh, the challenges we have faced and uh, also the opportunities that uh, have come with devolution in terms of uh, uh, reaching every corner of our country and for the first time, uh, corners of our country that had been left behind in terms of development are for the first time uh, uh, getting development, seeing tarmac roads for the first time in a place like Mandela, Wajia. They had never had tarmac roads for 50 years. And uh, because of devolution, we are seeing transformation of these counties and our country generally. We have uh, counties like Turukana that, um, uh, you know, you could not get basic uh, uh, health care, uh, you know, for our uh, Kenyans living there. They had to travel miles to go all the way to Moirifara Hospital just to get a CT scan or a dialysis. But now with the devolution, we are getting well-equipped hospitals, better uh, medical services from our counties to uh, our fellow Kenyans. And there's something to celebrate. Uh, it has been uh, a journey also with the challenges, as you are aware that even as we have been devolving uh, more resources to the counties, we have also been uh, uh, devolving uh, uh, corruption because uh, yeah. this has been a major challenge to, 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 to devolution, actually. So I must say that seven years later, it is a success story, mm -hmm. but not without challenges. Indeed, and we'll talk about the challenges uh, just as we have this conversation. But uh, just taking you back a bit, uh, you know, the aim was to ensure that uh, every Kenyan gets a slice of the national cake and gets you know, to feel like they're part of this country and they feel like they're getting what they deserve as Kenyans. Would you say that uh, 
we have achieved that. We still feel like there are quite a little, a, a little bit of complaints and concerns from other regions. Would you say that we have achieved uh, you know, that vision that we had? I would say it's work in progress because uh, uh, we must uh, admit uh, the truth that uh, our country has been uh, divided and uh, there has been uh, some element of marginalization of uh, certain parts of our country. And uh, devolution, the key object of devolution really under Article 174 of our Constitution was to really end this uh, marginalization and bring about equalization so that we are able to create a more just, a more equitable, a more uh, inclusive uh, country with shared prosperity. And devolution really holds a key to all this. And that is why even as... Uh, uh, we saw the uh, stalemate in the Senate over the new formula on the equitable sharing uh, of our revenue. It is the key issue so that we are a able to bring about a more equitable society. And I must say we are making progress. And when you look at uh, the leadership that His Excellency the President has provided, even when uh, we had these uh, stalemate, he, had, he stepped in, and uh, in consultation with the former prime minister and other leaders, we came together as a country, we worked with our Senate, and were able to break the stalemate. And now what we are looking at is a Kenya where every county is, uh, is, is gaining, every county is getting an equitable and fair share of the national cake. And this is about to be enhanced as we engage in the national conversation uh, through the BBI uh, initiative that uh, is doubling now, actually more than doubling what will be going to the counties from 15% to 35%. This will see a, a more equitable development across the country. So the era of marginalization is over and the key to this is devolution. And therefore, as, as a minister for devolution, one thing uh, as we are looking at the state of our nation that we ought to celebrate is devolution and uh, I'm very grateful to the president and the former prime minister that they made devolution really the centerpiece of uh, the BBI initiative and as we move forward we, as we engage in our national conversation there's nothing more important than the issue of devolution in the BBI conversation as we move forward because when devolution wins Every Kenyan is a winner. 47 million of us will be winners in all our 47 counties because every county would win. All right. Waziri, you say it has been um, a story of success but not without challenges. I want us to get there. Uh, talk to us about what you feel has been the biggest hindrance to the implementation of devolution seven years, close to seven years down the line. I would say uh, corruption remains the biggest enemy of devolution as we speak. Uh, resources that have been sent to the counties that are meant to develop these counties uh, have actually found uh, their way into pockets of individuals. And uh, on this score, again, uh, we must celebrate the leadership provided by our president for leading from the front on the war against corruption, on the strengthening of our institutions, key institutions like uh, the DCI, uh, we are looking at uh, the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission, we are uh, uh, looking at the uh, office of the DPP. They have all been strengthened and uh, at no point in our history have they received the political goodwill and support as they have under this administration. And in also in terms of enhanced resources, this has given them more capacity. And we see more prominent uh, prosecutions taking place, arrests taking place. And this shows you a country that is determined for the first time to fight corruption. And uh, there are no sacred cows. The president has been very clear to us, even in cabinet, if you are found to have engaged, don't go to him you go and face the full force of the law. That's why you can see no one has been spared, right from cabinet to uh, PSS to governors. We have many cases going on, many investigations going on, and this shows that we are indeed taking the bull by the horns. And we must thank the president for this, and also thank uh, the leadership of the country for giving the president support, because on his own he can't win. 
we also urge the governors because it will take uh, they, they, they say uh, uh, we will need the president and the governors working together to be able to uh, crush this mice of uh, uh, corruption. So apart from corruption, I uh, would also say that uh, we have had a problem of uh, little of the resources going towards development. In fact, you have uh, a situation where uh, in some counties, uh, the majority of the resources that are allocated are going to recurrent expense. When you uh, have little going towards development, it also again defeats the objects of uh, devolution because it was meant to go and develop these counties. So uh, we, we, it's one area that we want to, even as we are engaging in our national conversation on BBI, to see how, as we push more resources to the counties, how we can put mechanisms to ensure that the added resources actually go towards developing these counties. The third uh, challenge has been uh, the issue of counties uh, over-relying on the national treasury, on the exchequer. We want to see counties uh, generate more of their own uh, uh, revenue. Own source revenue is dwindling. And that is a key concern to us. So we want to see how that can be addressed. Because some counties are collecting less than the former local authorities. So we're asking what exactly is happening. So these are some of the challenges, but still, overall, devolution is a success story. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's interesting that, <coughs> interesting that uh, you know, you're talking about issues that revolve around funding and resources at the county level as the biggest challenges to devolution. And uh, talking about uh, the BBI report and the proposals contained therein, touching on the increased allocation uh, of, of revenue to counties, uh, which you mentioned earlier, and also talking about uh, how to find a way of ensuring that the money that is uh, taken to the counties is spent in the right way. Um, I would like to understand also, um, if we have not uh, you know, won the war against corruption at the county level, are we justified to ask for more funds? And even if we are talking about increasing the allocation uh, to counties, do we have the money? Can we afford that if we look at our, our current circumstances? Yes, I think it's a matter of making uh, the decision. Uh, and uh, of course, as I said, the Constitution gives that mandate uh, to the Senate uh, to ensure that... Uh, a, uh, they have an equitable way of sharing revenue between the two levels of government. So uh, it is the desire of the uh, majority of Kenyans, and that is why I'm very confident that the majority of Kenyans uh, will support uh, BBI to bring more resources to them. This will be a key win for every Kenyan. And uh, once that is uh, decided, it will be implemented. Because when uh, you look at... Uh, uh, what is going to the counties. We were talking about just about 316 billion. With what His Excellency the President uh, added, we are looking at about 370 billion. That is still uh, below 400 billion because we could find one ministry that uh, is actually getting about 400 billion. So it is something that. How are we spent that? Yes, it, it, it is something that. Uh, that actually, that yes, it is justifiable because we are also seeing the impact that this is having on the ground and how we are turning these counties into new engines of socioeconomic transformation of our country. In fact, we are late. Uh, you, you know, countries like uh, Nigeria that started early have grown their economies through these building blocks that uh, the regions have become. So we, if we strengthen the counties, uh, uh, they will be the new engines of our economic growth. And I've been to some counties that have done wonders. I just came from Kitui uh, about a week ago, and I was uh, impressed by what Governor Ngilo has done. With the little money she has done, she has started uh, uh, factories that are generating income for young people. Uh, when COVID came, we had challenges, you know, importing... Uh, uh, masks, uh, PPEs from uh, China. But now as we speak, PPEs, we have uh, masks being made in Kikotek, in Kitui. Quality. And in the process, they are generating income. The young people, young girls, young men who are working there and getting employment. 
Now, with the little she has been doing, she, uh, she has been getting, she's done wonders. I was asking myself, if we were able to give her double, she said she can be able to create more Kikotex in every sub-county. Now, this is how, once you grow the local economy, you spur local economic development, then you are now, uh, you, can, you, you, you are growing our national economy as well. So we must give the counties more. But also, what I, uh, I must uh, emphasize is that as we devote more resources, we must also enhance accountability. We must be able to ensure we hold the governors accountable. And this is something that we all have to work together to uh, increase on the mechanisms of uh, ensuring uh, transparency and accountability in the use of this money. All right. Uh, are we also looking at how to inspire the counties to generate more? How can we also tap into that uh, you know, area? This I think we must uh, thank CRA. CRA has uh, been uh, coming up with uh, new in in incentives to incentivize, uh, you know, counties to do better. We also must thank our development partners. Uh, we have a program uh, with the World Bank, uh, Kenya Devolution Support Program, where we are uh, uh, rewarding performance. And uh, we, uh, we have uh, about 20 billion from the World Bank that uh, we have been given to the counties. And... Uh, when counties perform and they are rewarded, they are encouraged to perform. The first year, I remember when I uh, took over the ministry, we had just 13 counties that qualified. Uh, uh, eventually, uh, we have seen a huge improvement to 20-something. Then lately, we have over 30 counties that have qualified, 33 actually, meaning performance is improving. And when you incentivize counties, you will be able to get better results and a better performance. So this is one area that we are looking at uh, in, as a ministry that is uh, uh, in charge of uh, uh, supporting the counties, building their capacity and giving them technical assistance. We were working very closely to incentivize them, to reward performance. And uh, there are some outstanding counties, uh, like uh, I've said, uh, Kitui, uh, Makweni, they're doing very, very well. Kakamega, uh, Governor Paranya's county is doing very So they are all on our top list of the counties that uh, have received recognition uh, nationally and internationally. And uh, they are being rewarded. So we want to see more of that. Okay, we hope that that will be replicated across the country to other counties as Correct. well. All right, uh, let's talk about uh, the proposal to introduce a World Development Fund contained in the BBI report. Yes. Uh, what do you think inspired this and what difference is it going to make? I think we want to see uh, devolution strengthened. So even as we are talking about uh, devolving more resources, would want those resources uh, devolved to, to have the uh, greatest impact in, the, in every county, in every sub-county, in every ward and location. It's very important that that happens. Uh, because we do know that just the way uh, there was marginalization nationally, uh, where uh, it would depend on the generosity of who is at State House, uh, you would have to go and say, Serikali Saidia, Serikali uh, to Naomba, but with devolution now, you don't have to do that. The equitable sharing of that uh, national cake is guaranteed by the Constitution to every Kenyan in whichever county they may live, no matter what region or religion they belong to. Uh, this is the greatest uh, achievement, actually, that uh, our new Constitution has guaranteed every Kenyan. Uh, but also we know that uh, just the way that marginalization was there, but even within counties, uh, I have been to some counties where there have been complaints, and uh, particularly counties that have strong inter-clan uh, issues, uh, clashes. You find that once one governor leaves office belonging to a certain clan and another one comes, uh, those of the other clan are victimized, they are marginalized. So they're, they're still marginalization even intra-county. So this is one thing we want to address, that uh, if uh, you have this county that has uh, this number of uh, wards, uh, and maybe some clans are in this area, others are being uh, sidelined, everyone is protected. Every ward in Kenya, 1,450 of them will get their rightful share. So all we would want is to urge Kenyans 
to give us honest leaders, leaders of integrity, from the governors uh, to the MCS to the MPs, so that we make sure that when these resources reach the counties, they achieve the primary objective uh, as set out under Article 174. So, so that uh, the objects of devolution are realized. And we believe that MCS have been pushing for this. Now uh, the BBI presents a very good opportunity to ensure that this succeeds, to ensure that there's equitable sharing of the national cake down to the ward so that every ward in Kenya, every county in Kenya, in every corner of our country receives development equitably. Again, I'll go back to my initial question. Can we afford this? Because many uh, critics of the BBI tend to feel like it's, it's, it's an expensive affair for the country. Like, for instance, this, it's sort of like duplicating fountains of funds. We have the funds that are allocated to the counties. We have the CDF as also a source of fund. We have, you know, creating another, uh, you know, source of fund again for, for a similar region. Isn't it duplicating, you know? It, it is not duplication as such. It is just a part of what is going uh, to the counties, going to the wards. And uh, the MCA having, uh, a, it's about 5% of that. So it, it will ensure that uh, also MCAs are not blackmailed by governors, you know, so that you have your own priorities in your ward with the community there. You know you are, uh, they the say is aware of the shoe who knows where it pinches. So uh, it, it's not duplication. As to the issue of the CDF, I think that's an ongoing, uh, uh, it's part of the national conversation, and I was very happy to see the robust engagement in uh, Naivasha when His Excellency the President and uh, uh, Prime Minister Raila Odinga engaged the members of parliament. I think they are uh, finding a way forward in terms of CDF and uh, how uh, the future will be. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, let's talk about... Um, the uh, women agenda and uh, there is that proposal to scrap the women representatives position and introduce um, you know a senatorial post for a male and a female for every county again how is this balance going to change the narrative in the leadership of the country and specifically the counties I, th I think uh, it's a good thing because uh, uh, it means for one uh, with the uh, added resources going to the counties the Senate would have greater responsibilities. And uh, to have 47 women senators where the actual cake will be shared is a big, big boost for the women of Kenya. That this culture that we've had, having, I mean, being a patriarchal society, that uh, the women's place is uh, in the kitchen, at home cooking for children, is uh, something that has been uh, overtaken by uh, events. And now we must be prepared to give women their rightful place on all forums of leadership. And the Senate is going to play a critical role in the leadership of this country. So in every county, women will be heard because they will be in the Senate, they will determine what's going to the counties, they will determine what is happening in their counties, and this is something very, very important. Apart from that, uh, we will also uh, be having the progressive uh, nurturing of women into leadership of governorship. Right now, I mean, we only had three women, uh, including uh, my good friend, the late Joyce Laboso, that we lost. Of course, after we lost her, we lost her place also. Uh, now we only have uh, Governor Iguru and Governor Ngilu. They are doing very well, but we'd like to see more women in uh, leadership as governors. We're very, very happy uh, uh, to see the American uh, elections uh, elevating for the first time a woman to the high office of vice president. Elect Will Kenya ever get there? <laughs> we see us going there, and that is why uh, BBI is going to play a major role, because with... Uh, more women are, are deputy governors. It will be very easy for them to uh, actually uh, become governors. They will be within striking distance. And uh, I think it's one way of empowering women at the counties, then empowering women at the national level, ensuring that uh, uh, we have one man and one man from every county in our Senate. It's a big uh, step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's a new dawn for... It is a new dawn for for Kenya and uh, for the women of Kenya. 
because regionally, uh, I can say that uh, we, we had been left behind. Because when you look at uh, the other parliaments, uh, when you look at Rwanda, they are over 50%. They were at 50-50. You look at Uganda, you look at Tanzania, uh, they are all in terms of percentage uh, over 30%. So though Kenya in the region, we are the economic superpower, we're the military superpower, but when it comes to matters to do with the women and leadership, we are the regional dwarfs. But through BBI, we are actually uh, uh, stepping forward. And uh, I think very soon we'll be able to take our rightful place as leaders in the region. Let's talk about uh, the current crisis, the COVID-19 crisis. We are in the second week of this particular crisis, Waziri. And as uh, the last time I checked, so far uh, over 60,000 people have tested positive to uh, the coronavirus in our country and over 1,000 people have died. Currently, if I look at, you know, the state of preparedness across the counties, recently there was that uh, sixth extraordinary session on the National and County Governments Coordinating Summit where the COG of the Council of Governors raised something that uh, was really worrying, uh, if you may ask me, that um, 12 counties are yet to reach the minimum 300 bed capacity and 11 counties had less than five ICU beds. Talking about such numbers in the wake of a second wave of COVID-19, should we be worried? We, we should be worried because uh, as we speak, when you look at... Uh, what's happening in the world. America, uh, I think, is the hardest hit so far, We're losing, uh, I mean, uh, with over 100,000 100, daily infections. They have uh, lost over 200,000 lives, and uh, millions have been infected. And uh, when uh, the matter uh, became the main issue in this election, it has actually taken Donald Trump home because Americans have taken the matter very, very seriously. When he was, uh, it was looking like he was not being very sincere about the seriousness of the situation. Joe Biden was very uh, forthright, and he has said America is facing a dark winter, meaning the second wave is coming, is already hitting America. Uh, in Europe also, I saw Angela Merkel, uh, the chancellor, talking about Europe also facing a difficult winter because the second wave is coming. When we had the sixth uh, extraordinary summit and uh, we listened to the situation, the experts, we all said the second wave is here with us in Kenya, so we must do more. So even for counties that uh, are letting down their guard, I think time has come now for us to do more than what we're doing. Uh, but uh, also the crisis has given us the opportunity to realize how important it is for us to work together, both levels of government. In the spirit of Article 6, we are supposed to consult, to cooperate, and to collaborate. Now, at no time have intergovernmental relations been as good as they are right now. Because of this crisis, uh, the two levels of government have come closer. We've had six summits back to back in one year. It had never happened. And uh, uh, this has made it uh, very, very uh, uh, possible for us to achieve quite a lot together and to realize that uh, when it comes to the lives of Kenyans, there are no Kenyans who belong to the county governments or Kenyans who belong to the national government. Uh, we all serve the same Kenyans. So we must, we are not in competition as a national government and a county government. We are not competitors. We are supposed to complement each other. And that's what we have been doing. And uh, we have set committees. When you look at uh, all the committees that were set up, including uh, the national emergency one led by uh, Mutai Kagwe, we had uh, a co-chair, Governor Kuti, the chair of health. When we're talking about uh, uh, the one for business and economic recovery chaired by uh, C.S. Yatani, uh, we had Professor Nyongo there and uh, Governor Wangamati Obungoma uh, working with him there. Uh, we had the one uh, uh, chaired by uh, Dr. Matiangi as well as uh, uh, Governor Oparanya. And uh, the one for food security, we had uh, Munya myself with... Uh, the Tarakanithi governor, Mudo Minjuki. So we have been working shoulder to shoulder, facing this crisis together, and I believe we have achieved a lot. We have increased our bed capacity across the country. 
We have also been able to uh, ensure that uh, even counties that had no ICU, each county has now isolation units and ICU, but all we want is to ask them to do more. Whatever we have given them, they must dedicate towards uh, ensuring that we improve our bed capacity, our services. So far, what would you say about how this, the funds that were allocated to counties for COVID response have been spent? What would you say? I would say, uh, I, I think, uh, for speaking for the counties, they have tried their best. And uh, I believe going into the future, uh, we have set mechanisms to ensure that they do better. Because uh, uh, a vaccine has not been found, we are not seeing uh, this thing going away. Uh, even in America, they are talking of uh, uh, trials, but we are not yet out of the woods. So we must still dedicate more resources, more focus, and more commitment towards fighting COVID-19. It's the greatest threat we have faced since our independence. And the second wave is serious. It what is. do you think has been like the we the weakest link in the war against COVID. We we were a while back we were sort of like getting into a safe zone and then suddenly things began rising. The trajectory no, it yeah. like things were getting mm -hmm. uh, better. Mm -hmm. So um, I must say we had relaxed a bit. And uh of course uh, we also had to weigh against uh, the uh consequences of shutting down the economy and uh balancing. But still, as we have said, uh, the president has repeated time and again, personal responsibility still remains the most critical issue so that uh, every citizen must take personal responsibility, but more so as the leaders. We must, as I was listening to Biden make his speech today, there's nothing as powerful as the power of example. We must lead by example. That is all I do to plead uh, with other leaders so that when we say we do away with the big rallies that are big spreaders, uh, the funerals are big spreaders, then that should actually be taken seriously, beginning with the leaders ourselves. What did you say um, was the biggest take home from the sixth extraordinary summit? What is happening already and what should be expected? I would say the commitment uh, by uh, our governors and the realization that this thing is not over, and the rededication of all of us to ensure that we fight harder and we work more closely together. All right. I want us to talk about um, the future of devolution and allow me bring in the Nairobi Metropolitan Service into this conversation. Um, so far, let's begin here. If you look at uh, since uh, it was established and uh, certain functions... Yes, I, I would say that uh, our constitution allows the transfer of uh, functions between the two levels of government, from uh, the county to the national, but also from the national to the county. So there was nothing strange about the Nairobi uh, uh, Metropolitan Service being formed and the transfer of certain functions uh, because we had a situation of paralysis in the leadership of uh, the Nairobi uh, City County and uh, the governor himself reached out uh, to His Excellency the President, and uh, after consultations, it was agreed that four key functions be transferred to the national government, and uh, so far you can see a, a great impact. Uh, General Badi has done a wonderful job. I think if you are to look at uh, the 100 or, 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 or so days of Badi and uh, 1,000 days of the Sonka administration, you can see that so much has been achieved within a very short period. And I believe the two years given, because it's not that we dissolve the Nairobi county government. The county government remains with other functions, with its governor, and uh, the functions were only transferred for a period of two years. And within, within a year, actually, the NMS, uh, the national government, is supposed to uh, you know, make a report to Parliament to account for what has been done, brief them on the progress, as well as to uh, the County Assembly of Nairobi. So I believe that when we are doing this annual report, we will be able to uh, show the country what has been achieved within a very short time. It is our desire that uh, no county... Uh, uh, fails or uh, is challenged 
it should be able to uh, you know discharge its mandate ably and for us as national government our role is uh, policy leadership is capacity building and the technical assistance but we'll only come in where there are situations that uh, demand so like what is like, like what has happened in Nairobi. And, uh, so what happens after two years? Is he, are the functions going to be turned back? Yes, they, they revert back. And constitutionally, they remain the uh, mandate of the county government. They have only been uh, lent to us for uh, a short period and uh, on uh, an understanding on what needs to be done. And uh, so much is being fixed uh, when you look at transport, when you look at health. Uh, within uh, the next one year, when we are now showcasing what has been done, even Nairobians themselves will, will be will be happy. When you go to slums like Korogosho, you go to Mukuru Kwajenga, Mukuru Kwaruben, Mukuru Kayaba, you will be shocked to see what is happening. Mbadi has penetrated those uh, slums. We have uh, seen the president visiting himself. We have new hospitals coming up and social amenities in areas that had totally been ignored. So we are happy with the progress, but also we will continue giving capacity to the county government of Nairobi so that it is uh, able to serve the people better. Mm -hmm. The ultimate goal is service delivery. And really uh, what every Nairobian wants, they, they don't care whether they are being served by the left or the right hand. What they want is service delivery. That is something we cannot compromise over. Okay. Uh, let's talk about, uh, you know, some concerns that have been raised with regards to what then this means for the future of devolution. Um, does it mean that we are going back, that at some point we could just go back to having one national government? No. Not true. Not true. In <laughs> fact, uh, that I would say has been uh, propaganda. Uh -huh that uh, uh, there's an intention of the national government clawing back, killing some counties, and uh, maybe killing devolution, as it happened uh, at, uh, uh, at after independence. That is not the intention of uh, this administration. I think uh, if there is one president who has shown his commitment to devolution, is President Uhuru Kenyatta. And uh, I think we have the right man uh, uh, at the right place, at the right time. When devolution was ushered in, he was the president who actually uh, oversaw the birth of devolution and has nurtured it. And though the constitution uh, requires that uh, we only have, uh, we have uh, not less than 15%, when you look at uh, what has been allocated right from uh, uh, 2013, 2014 up to now, it has always been about 15%. And now it is the same president leading from the front to say it's now time that uh, we give more to the counties uh, together with the prime minister. This is one area where his commitment cannot be uh, doubted and it's self-evident. Talking about the head of state, um, he is expected to be giving a state of the nation address uh, this coming week, specifically on Thursday. Ahead of that, expectations remain high. A lot is happening in the country right now. Uh, from where you sit, what do you think should be his center of focus? I think his center of focus should be national unity. Uh, they say in times of crisis, the wise build bridges, the fools build walls. And uh, we have seen that uh, when we came out of the elections, our country was divided. People lost lives. And this has happened every cycle of uh, elections. And that informed the wise decision of the president and the former prime minister, the protagonist coming together, having a handshake, and peacefully resolving their differences and putting the country above their personal, uh, you know, uh, differences that had costed the country so much that uh, was actually sending the economy down the drain. So that wisdom is what gave birth to the BBI initiative. And I believe even as he speaks to the country, apart from the crisis we had during uh, the elections, that the handshake 
restored calm in the country. The economy started picking. We're doing very well. Then we're hit by drought. We were hit by floods. We were hit by a locust invasion. And here comes COVID. In uh, like uh, uh, the most difficult period for our country. Kenya is a very resilient country. But never in our history has our resilience been tested to this extent. So in times of crisis, the wise build bridges. In times of uh, crisis, the fools build walls. Where we are, we need to pull together to build bridges, whatever differences we've had, bring the country together so that we are able to face these crises head on. We have a health crisis on our hands, the worst we've ever had. We have an economic uh, crisis on our hands. So we need the country to pull together, to work together. 2022 will come. We can go back to our camps. We can compete. We can fight. But for now, I think the president is asking for support to bring the country together, to fight the common enemy that is COVID-19, that is uh, the economic crisis we are facing. And to do this, we must pull together. To me, I think that message is very, very important. The rest, we, we have seen what uh, has been achieved in terms of the Big Four agenda, in terms of uh, uh, our infrastructural development. When you look at uh, what we've done uh, in terms of the SGR reaching uh, uh, Naivasha, now we have the uh, old railway being revived all the way up to Nanyuki, that is progress. The one that is now being worked on to Kisumu, that is progress. Once we connect with the Kisumu port that is ready for launching at uh, the end of the year, we'll see a boost in maritime transport across Lake Victoria. And we'll see uh, Kisumu becoming again the hub of the East African uh, uh, maritime business. So we, we are seeing big things happening in our country that of course he will, he will highlight. When you look at matters electricity, we've done very well. We have over 7 million Kenyans connected. We have a lot to celebrate. And these are things that we want to look at and say, look, we're making progress. Even in terms of digitalizing, look at our land records. We are making steady progress. Uh, the digitization of the judiciary, this is something to celebrate. Uh, the president and the chief justice have worked together very, very well. And we are seeing improved services across the country. So th there's a lot to celebrate, even in health itself. In spite of the crisis we are facing, we have now, as we speak, uh, through the uh, uh, strategy set uh, between the national government and the counties, every county now has a level four hospital. And this is uh, beginning to impact in terms of the crisis we are getting. So even as we're equipping these uh, hospitals, we are actually walking towards realization of UHC because once we have better equipped hospitals, we have better health services. And I believe the president in his speech will be able to highlight most of these things. So we have a lot to celebrate, including our roads. Looking at the number of kilometers that have been uh, 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 built within a very short time. We have over 7,000 kilometers. The target was 10,000. I believe by uh, uh, 2022, we should be able to hit target. And uh, my brother Mashari has done very well. I believe the president will be highlighting that in spite of the crisis we are facing, in spite of the difficulties of today and tomorrow, Kenya is making progress. When you go to uh, renewable energy, just the other day, uh, the president was up in Garissa launching the, 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 the solar plant. Before that, he was up in Loyangalani, you know, the Electrocana wind power, the largest in Africa. So, you know, the problem with Kenyans, we tend to look at, you know, uh, what divides us. Mm -hmm. But we do not have time to also celebrate the successes, the steady progress we are making in Africa. In fact, when we are talking of Africa rising, Kenya is a rising star of Africa. Yet we have we 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 focus on uh, besmirching each other, 
and mud slinging instead of uh, also looking at what unites us, or bringing the best out of us. This is our biggest witness. So I believe as we, the president comes to address us, uh, as we look at the state of our nation, in spite of the challenges we are facing, I believe we have a lot to celebrate and a lot of blessings to count and to thank God for as a nation. And to thank God for as a nation. Thank you so much, Waziri. He will be looking at the you know, bright side of the story. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing with us, for creating time for us. You. Um, you know, Just taking us through the chapters of the devolution story and how we are faring in the war against COVID-19 across the counties. Yes. That is the Cabinet Secretary in the Ministry of Devolution, uh, Eugene Wamal, was shedding some light on quite a number of issues that are significant to this particular country tonight. And we also thank you for creating time to cut this interview. My name is Safina Chieng Oma. Have a good night.